It's not all about the angels who sang for him that day. It's not all about the shepherds or the bright and shining star. It's not all about the wise men who travel from afar. It's about the cross. It's about my sin. It's about how Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about the storm that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the service here at New Hope Baptist Church. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this evening and uh, looking forward to what God has for us through the Word of God. If you would, take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5 this evening, book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, uh, as we get started and um, see what the Lord has for us tonight. I hope you will be in prayer uh, over the next week and a half uh, for our Christmas play, The Greatest story ever told. Uh, we're going to be held outside here in the parking lot at the church. We've been busy getting the set ready and actors practicing, singers practicing. And man, it's just going to be a tremendous time. We're looking forward to it. A lot to do before next Thursday night at 7 o'clock. That is when the first performance takes place, Thursday, December the 17th at 7 p.m. And you don't want to miss it. We'll have Thursday evening, Friday evening, Saturday evening, and Sunday evening. All of those start at 7 p.m. So make sure to make plans to be here. Make sure to invite your friends and family to come, be a part of that. The gospel will be presented uh, through our 
Christmas drama, and uh, we're just looking forward to it. We're having a blast getting ready for that. And uh, would you be in prayer for that? Pray for everybody involved. Pray for everybody that's uh, working hard to get it, get it ready to go. Pray that the gospel will go forth in power. Pray that souls will be saved, hearts will be encouraged this Christmas season, and that the Lord will be glorified and honored in everything we do. We sure would appreciate your prayers uh, for us during the time. Take your Bibles again, Ephesians chapter number 5, and let's look down in verse number 26. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26, the Bible says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Father, I pray that for the next few minutes, as we dive into the Word of God, and we study our Bibles this afternoon, this evening, Father, whenever this lesson, this message is being heard, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would stir our hearts, that, Lord, it would challenge us and convict us of areas of our life that need to be changed. Father, I pray that our lives would be different because the Word of God works in our lives today. We love you. I pray that if there's anybody listening to the message that, Lord, that they don't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray that they would bow their head and ask you to forgive their sins and to save their souls. The greatest day of their life is the day they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that they would ask Jesus to be their Savior today. We love you and thank you for your blessings in our life. And these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I love the book of Ephesians. Uh, Probably if I had to say what my favorite book of the Bible would be, the book of Ephesians would be my favorite book. It deals a lot with how we as Christians are to live. It deals a lot with we as Christians, our position with Christ and, and all the riches and all the inheritance that he has given to us through Jesus Christ the moment we got saved. I love the book of Ephesians. It's just so rich and When we come to Ephesians chapter number five, uh, Paul is dealing with a lot of things that we uh, are to be living as Christians, the way we ought to live as Christians. In verses one through two, Paul deals with our fellowship. He says, be therefore followers of God as dear children. We are to follow God. It's amazing to me that many Christians spend their life following a bunch of different things. We follow sports teams. We follow news outlets. We follow social media. Uh, We follow influence. We follow uh, uh, music groups. We follow a lot of different people. But Paul said the most important fellowship that we should have as Christians is to follow God as dear children. I love that. I I love uh, the thought that we should follow God closely. How far off do we get from God sometimes? I think about the times that my children will follow me around when I'm doing things and they're around. Uh, uh, My sons, man, if I'm working on something or or, or playing a game, whatever I'm doing, and they're around, they want to be there with me most of the time. As they get a little older, that kind of disappears, and they like being and doing their own thing sometimes. But those young ones especially like to be right there with dad or right there with mom. And as children of God, we ought to, be, want, we ought to want to be right there with him, be followers of God. Verses 1 to 2, he deals with our fellowship. In verses 3 to 5, he deals with our freshness our cleanliness, our purity as Christians. He names off several things that ought not to be a part of our life as children of God, things that ought not to be named amongst us and in our lives that we ought to have no uh, no dealings with that should not be a part of our life. And sometimes we're accused as Christians of living life of just a whole list of things we ought not do. And there are some things as Christians that should not be a part of our life. In verses 6 through 13, he deals with our fellow. He deals with our fellowship and and, and the things that we as Christians participate in and and that we fellowship with and the people that we fellowship with. And listen, there's some things as Christians that we should not have any fellowship with. There's some things the Bible says in verse number 11 that we should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. 
Oh, how many times do our lives get in trouble and our lives get away from God because of the fellowship that we have in our lives, whether it's through or the things we view on the television or the things we read in books or the things we look at online, the things that we allow to influence our lives, the things that if publicly we were asked, we would say, oh no, we don't have any part of that. That's not the way we live our life, but we invite those things into our lives. We invite those things into our families. We invite those things into our relationship with God and it affects us and it deals with the way we ought to fellowship and the way we should not fellowship. In verses 14 through 20, it deals with our fervency. It deals with our fervency. The Bible says in verse number 14 of Ephesians 5, wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Paul deals with our fervency as Christians. We ought to have a fervency. Oh, listen, we look at this world. We look at our nation. We look at the day and age that we live in and like never before, it seems we need some Christians who are on fire for God. We need some church members. We need some youth pastors and pastors and deacons and song leaders and special singers and musicians. We need some church members who are on fire for God. We need some we need some Christians who are fervent about the things of God. Oh, we got to the point, I believe, that like the Laodiceans of Revelation, we become lukewarm. We're neither hot nor cold. We say the right things. We go the right places, but there's no fire in our hearts for God and the things of God. Oh, would we have some people, would we have some teenagers uh, who would be on fire for God? Would we have uh, some believers who have a fervency for Christ, who are determined uh, that I know the day is bad. I know the hour is late. I know Christ is soon returning. And because of that, uh, I'm going to burn within my heart. The fire of God is going to burn within my heart. I'm going to have a passion for God that I've never had before. Oh, we need some Christians who have a fervency. And then in verses 21 through 31, he deals with our family. He deals with the relationship of family. He talks about how we ought to be with one another in verse 21. Then he deals with the relationship of husbands and wives. And then he deals with the relationship of Christ and the church. All these things he is dealing with, what a tremendous picture that Christ gives, a relationship. He, he draws the analogy of the relationship of husband and wife to the way Christ is with the church. Oh, what a tremendous way as we as men ought to love our wives the same way that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. What a high standard to live up to. That's what he calls of us to do. That's what he calls, the way he calls for us to live. And in the middle of this passage of Scripture, now draw your attention to verse number 26. Right in the middle of this, uh, he, gives, he gives a verse of Scripture here that tells the way he wants his church to be. He says in verse number 26, that in verse number 25, he says that he gave himself for the church. He died for the church. Listen, he loved us so much that he died for us. And in verse number 26, he tells us one of the reasons why he gave himself for the church. That, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. And I'll draw your attention to the last three words of that verse. By the word. By the word. Christ wants to sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the word. There's some teaching that is prevalent in our country. This teaching is that you can be saved and live any way you jolly well please. That you can be saved on your way to heaven and still live the sins of the world and still live the sins of the spirit and the sins of the flesh and that you can live your life any way you please because Jesus has saved you and it doesn't matter, nothing else matters. Well, my friend, the Bible is very clear. 
God not save you to leave you like you are. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians 5, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When a person gets saved, God begins a work in that person. He begins to cleanse, and he begins to mold, and he begins to make, and God loves you too much. He paid too much for you to leave you the way you are. Now listen, we as Christians, there are times, uh, more times than we, we like to admit, there's more times than I wish to admit this, this afternoon uh, that, that I have disappointed my heavenly Father, that I have sinned against him. And listen, there is nothing in the word of God that says once you get saved, you will be perfect and never sin again. That's not the way it works. But what the way it does work is that God is working in our lives, that God is molding our lives, that God is making in our our lives uh, so that he might in verse 26 sanctify and cleanse us you see it is the will of God that we live pure lives that we live clean lives that we live holy lives those are dirty words it seems like in the Christian's vocabulary anymore if you preach on holiness and cleanness then you're called a legalist you're called all kind of things you're called old fashioned hey listen it's still in the word of God God desires you and I as Christians to live clean holy sanctified pure lives how does that happen? We can't sanctify ourselves. We can't purify ourselves. We can't, we can't make ourselves holy. But God's given us everything we need to accomplish that work in our lives. He said that he gave himself for the church. He gave himself for you and me this afternoon that he might sanctify. The word sanctify means to set apart and to cleanse it with a washing of water by the word. And so with all of that as background, I want to just for the next few minutes, for just a few minutes, ask you this question. How important is God's word in your life? How important is the Bible in your life? You see, the Bible should be everything to us as Christians. The Bible ought to be our all-consuming. It, it ought to consume us. Our love for the Word of God should consume our lives because that is what God is using to accomplish. Listen, God doesn't write his message on billboards on the side of the road, although those are tools to point people to Christ. But God doesn't write his message in the clouds. He wrote his message to us. He wrote the principles that we should live by to us. He wrote everything that you and I ought to know right here in his word. So how important is the word to you? I want to show you this this afternoon with a little illustration. When a person gets saved, he's a new creature. One of the greatest things that takes place the moment a person comes to Christ and asks Jesus to save them from their sins, one of the greatest things takes place at that moment, and that is that uh, that person's sins are completely forgiven. All sins past, present, and future are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. I, I'm glad for the blood of Jesus Christ this afternoon. The Bible says in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Hey, without the blood of Jesus Christ, you cannot have your sins forgiven and washed away. The moment a person comes to Christ and bows in repentance of their sins, Jesus forgives them of every sin ever committed, every sin thought of being committed. He cleanses them. There is nothing cleaner than a Christian who just got saved. There is nothing cleaner than a, than a person who just accepted Christ as their Savior. There's no sin in their life. It's all been taken away. It's like this glass of water. It is completely filled with the Holy Spirit of God in that moment. Every sin is taken away, and it is filled with the Holy Spirit of God as he takes up residence in that, that individual's life. Man, what a, what a beautiful picture. How, how, how refreshing it is to see somebody get saved, to see their fire for God, to see that freshness in their life, to see that zeal for Christ, to see uh, uh, that just like a little child, that innocence of, of just receiving Christ and all the sins are forgiven, how refreshing it is. Oh, I love watching a new Christian who, who still has that, uh, that spring in their step and that smile on their face from asking Christ to be their Savior. It's like this glass of water. 
is fresh. Man, we look at something like that and, and the world looks at something like that and, and listen, we're living in a world who is thirsty for something. There, there, there is a void in their lives and we're living in a world that is empty of things that satisfy. Oh, they're not empty of, uh, of pleasure. They're not empty of things to fill their life, but they're empty of things that satisfy, that bring purpose, that bring that satisfaction. Why? Because there's only satisfaction found in Jesus Christ. Only God can feel that emptiness in a person's life. And the world sees a Christian. The world sees a Christian who's clean and pure. And there's something there that they don't have. And to somebody who's thirsty, somebody who wants a drink of cool, fresh water, this looks amazing. But as we live our life, we are in the world. It's amazing that God told us we would be in the world. He told us that we would be a part of this world. Why? Because we are to be light in this world. We are to be the salt of the earth. Listen, God never intended to us, for us to live completely isolated from the world. He put us here so that we would be a light. Light's no good if there's no darkness. We live in a dark world and God wants us to be light. The problem is while we're in the world, there are many times that the things of the world become a part of us. There are many times when we battle this flesh every day. We got saved and we got the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us, but we still battle the flesh. We still battle our mind. We still battle the influence of this world. And many times the things of the flesh, the things of this world begin to creep in and be a part of our lives by our choice. There are times that we as Christians, we allow things that have happened around us to make us bitter. Not many people enjoy lemon juice straight, right? But we allow this lemon juice to get into our lives and it begins to make us bitter. Maybe somebody said something bad about us or somebody looked at us funny or somebody refused to speak to us or Maybe somebody did something extremely wrong and we couldn't control that, but we allow bitterness to creep into our lives and it begins to taint our life as Christians. Listen, there's nothing in the Word of God that gives you and I any right as Christians to be bitter. The Bible calls bitterness a root that defiles many, but we allow it many times. And then we look across the church where we go. We look across the congregation and we see somebody that has something that we don't have. Maybe it's a material possession. And, and, and all of a sudden we allow that green monster of envy to begin to creep into our lives. And it begins to be a part of our day-to-day -day life. It begins to consume our mind. Oh, it might not be anything big. It may be, it may be something small. It could be something big. But we look across at a brother and sister in Christ, or even somebody who's unsaved, and we see something in their life that they have and we don't, and it bothers us. It's amazing. We look at somebody and say, "Well, they got a brand new truck, but I didn't get a brand new truck. Are they any better than I am? Better than I am, and so I deserve a brand new truck." And before long, the blessings of God on somebody else's life has allowed us, has caused us to get to a place where we allow envy in our life. I've seen it in church. Uh, somebody gets a part in a play that, that, that I thought I should have, and, and all of a sudden now I have ill will toward that person, and they didn't do anything. All they were was available to be a servant for the Lord Jesus Christ. But by them being a servant in their area of service, now it has made me upset. Now it has made me mad. Now it has put me at odds with a brother and sister in Christ that they have no idea that I'm at odds with them, but it has contaminated my life. It allows us many times to become angry. Man, there's sometimes, if we're not careful, anger begins to creep in our life. Now there is, before you get holier than that, I'm all super spiritual on me, I realize there is a thing called righteous anger, righteous indignation. The Lord Jesus Christ had that, and so many times we think we got righteous anger, but it's very unrighteous. These things begin to be a part of our life. 
and they creep into our life and they begin to taint our life as Christians. Man, some of us are real angry. <laughs> Man, it just pours in. And we give all kind of excuses why we have the right to be angry, why there are things in our life that have, uh, allow us and give us the excuse to be the way we are. But the Bible says, be angry and sin not. How many times does our anger bring us to the point of sinning against God? It allows us to take out our anger on our family. It allows us, we, we get to the point we take our anger on those around us. And, and many times we take out our anger on people who deserve it the least. And it damages our life. Huh. Sometimes we begin to allow addictions to control us. There are things in the word of God that God is very clear should not control you and I as Christians. But many times they do. Maybe it's an addiction with alcohol. Maybe it's an addiction with drugs. Maybe it's an addiction with pornography. Maybe it's an addiction to video games. Whatever is controlling your life other than the Holy Spirit is sin against the Holy Spirit. And those things begin to pour into our lives and take control of our lives. I want you to notice something. Where once we were filled with the Holy Spirit of God, as these things began to creep into our life, do you notice how now my glass is overflowing, but it's not overflowing with cool, clear, fresh Spirit of God dwelling in my life. Now it's overflowing of the things of the world, the things in my life that are contaminated my life. They're now overflowing on the, to those around and to the world around me. And as a Christian, the things that are controlling my life and the things that are damaging my character are now damaging my, my testimony. And we look around and, and many times we think that we sin, that we dishonor God and that we disrespect God and it only affects us. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We never disobey. God in a vacuum. We never dishonor God to ourselves. We never sin, but that it doesn't affect somebody else. Our sin always carries over to those around us. It always affects those around us. It always affects our family. It'll affect your wife or your husband. It'll affect your sons and your daughters. It'll affect your parents and grandparents. It'll affect those that you go to church with. When we allow the things of this world and the flesh to control us and to contaminate us, it damages our testimony and it affects those around us. These things begin to pour over into our lives. Oh, then we have the big ones. The things that we always think about being ugly and mean and, and, just, and just wickedness against God. We, you've got immorality and fornication, adultery, all those things. Man, we look at and it's just it just makes our life dirty. And it makes our life undesirable. Man, it just, it just muddies up our entire life. And the longer we go, the worse it gets. Oh, but wait a minute. There are times in our life that we as Christians look the part. We as Bible-believing Christians say all the right words, do all the right things, carry the right Bible, sing the right songs, say the right verses. We even put our money in the offering plate. Man, we look good. Most of my kids growing up have always loved apple juice. And that's what they want to drink for meals. That's what they want to drink in between apple juice. And if you were to look at that, you, would, you, you could be convinced that that's apple juice until you get it close enough to smell it. And it's not apple juice. It looks good, but on the inside it stinks. Vinegar looks a lot like apple juice until you get it close. And then it stinks. There are many times we as Christians allow self-righteousness, hypocrisy into our life. 
We become like the Pharisees that outwardly look good, outwardly kept the law, outwardly live righteous lives, but inside were decay and rotted flesh. We as Christians allow this self-righteousness into our lives. And it contaminates us. We look at these things and our life is absolutely filled with nothing but junk. I wouldn't want to drink that, would you? <laughs> Can I tell you, Christian, neither does the world. I'm ashamed to say that many times in my life I've been consumed with things that doesn't draw anybody to Jesus Christ. When an unsaved man or an unsaved woman looks at your life as a Christian, do they see anything in your life that is desirable? Do they see anything in your life that would point them to Jesus Christ? I'm not asking, are you sinlessly perfect? I'm not asking, are you everything you ought to be? All of us have ways to grow. All of us have things we need to work on. But does our life as Christians point others to the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? There's nothing about that now that anybody wants any part of. There's nothing about this now that would point a dying world to Christ. You know, a lot of people look at Christians and they see somebody who's no different than a non-Christian except they waste two hours on Sunday morning at church. That's all they see. And there's nothing about their life different than the unsaved world. And that's a shame. Because Christ never intended for our life to be this way. Christ never intended for us uh, to be a, a, a repulsive uh, representation of Christ. He never intended for us uh, to push people away from himself. He intended for us to be light and salt. He intended for us to draw people, to our testimony of what Jesus has done in our life, to draw people to the word of God to be saved. That's what he intends for our life, but how many times do we allow things in our life by our choice to contaminate us? <laughs> Been there more times than I wish to admit. God doesn't intend for us to stay that way. What does the Bible say in the book of Ephesians chapter number five? In verse number 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water, by the word. You see, God wants us to live clean, and God wants us to live pure. And there are times in our life uh, when we're not clean, and we're not pure, and it's up to us uh, to come to the place in our life where we say, God, I'm tired of being a poor testimony. I'm tired of being displeasing to my heavenly Father. I am tired of the sin that I have consistently allowed into my life. I'm tired of my character being damaged. I am tired of living as a Christian should not live. There's a great verse of Scripture in the book of 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins... <laughs> He's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins and forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God has made you a promise and God has made me a promise uh, that if I'd come to him uh, and confess my sin uh, as a Christian, uh, hey, hey, listen, he doesn't save me again. I don't need to get re-saved. Uh, I need to get re-cleansed. Uh, he's promised that if I come uh, and confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins uh, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God said if you would come and agree with him about your wickedness, about your unrighteousness, about your poor testimony, about your rotten character, if you would apologize and ask forgiveness, if you would come to God and confess your sins, he says, I'll cleanse you. How does he do that? <laughs> Verse 26 tells us, by the washing of water, by the word. 
Romans 12 and one, verse, one and verse two. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, you may have a dirty mind this morning or this afternoon, but you can be transformed. You may have a dirty testimony, but you can be transformed. You may have a wicked life and a filthy heart, but it can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can be transformed by the power of God's word. Listen, the word of God has the power to cleanse, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When you got saved. You got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You got the Holy Scriptures uh, working outside of you to mold and to make you. And I love what God does. Uh, He takes the Holy Spirit of God. He takes the the Word of God, and he begins to form us to make us look like the Son of God. And the Bible says he will sanctify and he will cleanse us by the washing of water. Watch it. By the Word. You will never be cleansed as you ought to as a Christian apart from this book right here. You will never be purified apart from the word of God. So I'm asking you this afternoon, how important is God's word in your heart? Far too many Christians have wicked lives because we're far away from our Bibles. We don't read our Bibles. We may or may not even bring it to church with us on Sunday morning. We definitely don't read it on Monday. We definitely don't study its pages on Tuesday. We definitely don't meditate on its word on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. We definitely don't allow it to convict and to challenge and to change our lives. And and on Sunday morning, we may, if it's convenient, pick it up and carry it to church with us and we wonder why our lives are absolute wrecks because we don't allow the word of God. But when we come to the word of God, we come to Christ and say, God, I've sinned against you. I confess my sins. God says, I'm, I'm faithful. I'll forgive your sins. I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. How does he cleanse us? By the word of God. See, we come to the word of God, and when we get right with God, he takes the word of God and he begins to cleanse us. He begins to deal. He begins to deal with that self-righteousness in our life. He takes the pure, clean word of God, and he begins to pour it into our life. The Bible begins to tell us things like, know you not the same judgment you meet, it shall be meted to you again. And all of a sudden we realize that the standards that we've been holding everybody else to in our church, we ought to hold ourselves to. We begin to realize that our standards and our convictions in our life aren't what makes us spiritual. We please God with the way we live. We ought to live clean, but our attitudes need to be corrected. We don't need to be like that second prodigal son that was bitter and angry and although he did the right things and God begins to pour the word of God in our life that clean pure word he begins to wash us he begins to deal with us and so he deals with the self-righteousness and then he deals with those addictions and we begin to study and God begins to pour scripture in our life like the book of Galatians where it says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He begins to be, be dealing with those uh, sins of addiction and those things that have held us captive. And the word of God begins to pour into our life. He begins to pour into our life. Romans chapter 6 where it says, Know ye not that to whom ye you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether sin under death or obedience under righteousness. He begins to pour that clean, pure word of God into our life and it begins to cleanse us. It begins to mold us and make us. He begins to deal with the immorality in our life. He begins to deal with those things, uh, those temptations that we've been yielding to, those, those fleshly desires uh, that we have allowed to control us. He begins to pour in the cool, clear, refreshing word of God. He begins to pour in scripture like Let no man say when he is tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. He begins to pour in scripture in our life, like 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, there is no temptation taking you, but such is common man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. 
that poor, cool, crisp, refreshing word of God is poured into our life and it begins to cleanse us. He begins to deal with the bitterness and envy. He says, let all wrath and evil, clamor and evil speak and be put away from you with all wrath and with all malice. And he begins to clean those things up in our life. He said, uh, he said uh, to deal with that brood of bitterness and the, the scripture begins to be poured into our life. The way we've treated one another, it begins to pour in our life. Be kind one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. And that scripture begins to cleanse our life, and it begins to pour in our life, and he begins to deal. Oh, and then he starts dealing with the anger in our life. He says, hey, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Be ye angry and sin not. He begins to deal with that wrath. He begins to deal with that anger. He begins to deal with that malice that we've had toward others. And the word of God begins cleansing us. And all of a sudden, he's working in our life uh, and he's putting those scriptures in our life that deal with the things that are part of us. And man, all of a sudden, we fall back in love with the word of God. And, and we're not content just to listen to it on Sunday morning when the message is being preached. Uh, but on Monday morning, we get up uh, and we get in our Bible and we fall on our faith before God. Uh, and God says, you say, search me, oh God, and know me. Try my heart and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Oh, you begin to ask God to search out things that you didn't even realize was a part of your life. You begin to ask God to know everything in your life and to cleanse it out. More God begins to reveal things in your life that you didn't realize was a problem, that you forgot was even there. God begins to bring those things to light and it begins to work. On Tuesday morning, you get on your knees with your Bible and you begin reading it. You begin praying about it. And on Wednesday morning, you're still meditating on the things that God has showed you in his word. Thursday, you're still singing his prayer. You're still full of love with Jesus Christ again. You're faithful to the word of God again. Friday, you're, you're reading your Bible with your family. Dads, you're living your family and family devotions and around the family altar again and praying with them. Why? Because the word of God is doing a work in your life that you can't do yourself. On Saturday, you wake up looking forward to Sunday because the word of God's done something in your life. It's working in your life. And all of a sudden, before you know it, it's been a whole week You've studied and read your Bible every day. You can't remember the last time you've been in your Bible every day of the week, but all of a sudden, because you've fallen in love and gotten right with God, the Word of God is a constant influence and, and, and force in your life that is cleansing and working to make you what you and I ought to be. And as the Word of God works in our lives, we become more and more like Christ. We become more and more cleansed. We become more and more like he wants us to be. Oh, there's still things in our life that are there. There are still problems that we have to deal with. There are still times that we disappoint God. That's where the word of God comes in. <laughs> and it keeps pouring. It keeps working. Sometimes that word comes in our life through our personal daily Bible reading. Sometimes the word of God comes into our life through preaching that we hear at church on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night. Or may, the word of God may enter into our lives as we listen to it being preached on the radio or on YouTube. Listen, one of, one of my favorite things to do for my own personal life is pull up messages online and listen to them while I travel. Listen to them while I'm going back and forth throughout my day. Why? Because I need the word of God in my life. Without the word of God pouring into my life, the things of this world will contaminate me. The things of this world will dirty my mind. The things of my flesh will ruin my testimony and my character. So I need a daily steady diet of the word of God so that it can cleanse, so that it can sanctify, so that it can purify my life. So that when the world looks at me, in the middle of the junk surrounding they see something that they desire, something that they don't have, something that only Christ can bring. We as Christians, our lives ought to be pointing people to Jesus Christ. When they come up and say, hey, why don't you say the things that other people say? You don't talk like I talk. What's the difference? The difference is Jesus. 
You don't go to the same places that I go. Why not? The difference is Jesus. You as a man are faithful to your wife. Why is that? Why don't you run around? Why don't you flirt with the other women? Because of Jesus. Why don't you, why don't you hang out with those of us at the bar on Friday night? Because of Jesus and our life. You point others to a Savior who can satisfy every need that they've ever had, every longing that they have, every desire that they have. Jesus can fulfill it. Jesus can fill that void. And you and me, our lives, can either point people to Christ or drive them away from Christ. The difference starts with how important our Bible is to us. So I ask you this afternoon, how important is God's word to you? Would you bow with me, please? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the word of God. Lord, I thank you for working in our hearts. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that as we come to the close of this service, as we come to the close of this Bible message and lesson, I pray that you have done something in our hearts. God, I pray that you would continue to work in my life. God, I need you. I need your Holy Spirit and your Holy Scriptures constantly working in my life. I pray that there's somebody here listening to this message on the Internet, Father, who will right now bow their heads and come to you in confession of sins. Lord, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I pray that you would do that in their lives and they would submit to you in humility and humbleness and we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do for us. Bless this day as we seek to live for you. And these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen.